Welcome back to another episode of Required Reading. Uh, we have finished up our last book, and now we're moving on to a brand new one, just in time for the spooky season. We're going with the novelization of the movie Halloween, released in 1978. Uh, this novelization is written by Curtis Richards. Of course, based on the screenplay written by John Carpenter. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and read chapters 1 through 3. Prologue. The horror started on the eve of Samhain in a foggy veil in Northern Ireland at the dawn of the Celtic race. And once it started, it trode the earth forevermore wreaking its savagery suddenly, swiftly, and with incredible ferocity. Then, its lust sated, it shrank back into the mists of time for a year, a decade, a generation perhaps. But it slept only and did not die, for it could not be killed. And on the eve before Samhain it would stir, and if the lust were powerful enough, if it would rise to fulfill the curse invoked so many Samhains before, then the people would bolt their doors. Scant good it did them, for the thing laughed at locks and bolts, and besides, they were the unwary, always the unwary. Samhain, the druid festival of the dead, the summer had passed, and so too had the outburst of early fall warmth, now known as Indian summer. The green had gone out of the land, the crops harvested, the chill of winter had descended like an angel of death. The people, fearing the sun might never again warm the land, held their festival to appease Makala, their deity. On hillsides and in the caves and daubs and wantle huts, great fires were lit, to which the spirits of the departed were invited by their kinsmen to warm themselves to be cheerful before the snows blanketed the earth. Druid priests divined who would live and die in the coming year, who would marry, bear children, wax rich, enjoy good health, and they attempted to hold at bay, through sacrifices and other rites, the witches and goblins that ran amok at that time, stealing infants, destroying crops, killing farm animals, and sometimes worse. Deidre was the third and youngest daughter of the druid king, Gwynlil. Her hair was sandy brown with amber highlights, her eyes sea green, her complexion cream and wild rose. She was already taller than her older sisters, and her early development had been the cause of much concern in the tribal community. The other virgins tittered with envy. The married women voiced disapproval and counseled her mother to marry her off before the girl yielded to her budding impulses. The young warriors eyed her yearningly, and the old warriors thought forbidden thoughts and reflected on their faded memories. His name was Inda. He was fifteen, and he loved Deidre with a secret passion that tortured him and at night caused him to cry out in his sleep. When it became rumored that Deidre's father, the king, was preparing to offer her hand in marriage, Inda consulted his kinsmen and asked if they thought his suit would be looked upon in favor. He suspected what the answer would be, but his longing overcame his embarrassment. Ho oh, ho! Deidre marry you, his father cackled, with your shriveled arm and your twitching mouth for Inda had presented himself wrong in first when his mother birthed him, and the midwives had made a botch of his delivery. She would soonest marry my goat, howled his uncle. Or Blulik, his brother added, pointing to the runty dog worrying a greasy bone in the corner of the hut. Besides, said his father, I'm told she's b betrothed to Kulain. Now, there's a lad worthy of that wench's pretty hole, his uncle burst out, raising his wineskin to his fat lips, and they continued to discuss Deidre's charms as Inda retreated miserably from the hut into the cold night. The boy suffered tortures such as only the adolescents can. At length, he determined on a plan. 
if he could somehow get directly to Deidre, he would convince her that though he was ill-favored physically, he was in every other respect a fitting candidate for her hand. This was easier said than done, however, because virgins were closely watched by their mothers, or by truculent warrior brothers. Nevertheless, one day Inda seized an opportunity when Deidre went to fetch water from the stream at the foot of the hill. He followed her furatively, darting from tree to tree until he found her stooped over the stream, singing softly to herself as the water filled her clay pitchers. Deidre? he called timidly. She turned and gasped, eyes round with fright. You! What do you want? Her body tensed, and she seemed ready to bolt. I... I want to... The panic in her face alarmed him. He had expected to startle her, but had not imagined she would greet him with such revulsion. He stepped forward, hand extended, pacifically. But she jumped back, misinterpreting the gesture. She stumbled, almost falling into the stream, and Inda moved swiftly to rescue her. No! she shrieked. Get away from me, monster! She found her feet and burst into a run, crying, Help! Help! He means to rape me! Inda's body had been deformed at birth, but not until that moment had his soul been formed. And now it was Samhain, and Inda, humiliated beyond reason, stood on the perimeter of the celebrants dancing and chanting around the bonfire. In his left hand he held a fat wineskin, from which he drank often. In his right he held a foot-long butcher blade, which he used to cut the throats of pigs and chickens. His eyes were fixed bitterly on the figures of Deidre and Colain, whirling exuberantly around the fire, to the immense approval of the tribe, for their betrothal had been announced to the joy and relief of all. Inda's legs shook, and his body trembled in the cold night, though the heat of the fire was intense. And when the couple pirouetted past him once more, he leapt out like a wildcat on his twin prey. Unarmed, their elbows linked, they didn't have a chance. And his blade sliced easily through Colain's jugular and windpipe. His legs kicked out in a grotesque finale to his dance of life. Then he fell like a slaughtered bull, dragging Deidre downward. Her head turned away, she laughed, believing that her drunken partner had merely stumbled. And his blade caught her with the laughter on her face the same laughter that had mocked him after she had run safely into the arms of her tribesmen the day he had approached her at the stream. The highly honed weapon plunged into her breast up to the hilt, and the clamor no one heard the explosion of wind from her lungs, the gurgle of blood, the whimper, or saw the look of dreadful recognition as the light faded from her eyes, except for Enda. The thrill of revenge was the last emotion Enda knew. For a moment later, he was literally torn apart by the enraged tribe. Only his head and his heart were preserved, gathered up after their frenzy had subsided, at the request of the grieving king. After Deidre and Kulain were buried on the hallowed ground the following day, Inda's head and heart were carried to the summit of the Hill of Fiends, where cowards and other outcasts were left to rot unblessed. The king asked his shaman to pronounce a special curse over the remains of this vile murderer. Thy soul shall roam the earth till the end of time, reliving thy foul deed and thou foul punishment, and may the god Mokala visit every affliction upon thy spirit forevermore. The sky darkened and lightning flashed. The day suddenly grew black and cold, and out of nowhere gusts of snow lashed the tribal party. In the history of the tribe, it had never snowed so early in the year. Satisfied that Makala had heard his prayer, the shaman summoned his people to turn their backs on Inda and return to their bereft village. The celebration of Samhain's Eve was transmuted over the centuries. The invading Romans carried the tradition back from English isles with them in the form of the harvest festival of Pomona, and the early Christians deemed their celebration Hallow Mass, 
The popes of the Middle Ages consecrated November 1st as All Saints Day, and All Hallows' Eve slurred into Halloween as the holiday was transmuted over the next millennium. With the coming of modern civilization, the superstitions and traditions of the original festival lost their meaning and vitality. Token recognition could be seen in the custom of lighting candles and jack-o'-lanterns, hanging effigies of witches and goblins outside homes, and playing good-natured pranks that were a feeble cry from the mayhem of the old times. Children paraded about in costumes whose significance had long ago lost their correspondence to the terror of evil that had once gripped the world at the onset of winter. Halloween, like many of the holidays, had become an empty shame. Except that from time to time the innocent frolic of All Hallows' Eve was shattered by some brutal and inexplicable crime, and the original spirit of the celebration was brought home to a horrified world. Then the people would bolt their doors. Scant good it did them. And besides, they were always the unwary. Chapter 1 it was 1963, and America was sure of itself, or at least seemed to be, particularly in Haddonfield, Illinois. The tensions of the Cold War of Cuba, the dark stirrings in Southeast Asia, lapped at the door of this placid and undistinguished Midwestern town, but didn't really touch it. In less than a month, the president would be murdered in Dallas, signaling an era of tremendous violence and heartbreak that would reach deeply into the homes and hearts of Americans across the land. But that was in the future, and tonight, October 31st, was a time for fun. It was Halloween. Perhaps even more than Christmas, it was the most innocent holiday on the calendar. Yes, more than Christmas, because Christmas celebrated a happy event, and Jolly St. Nick was a benevolent symbol anyway. But Halloween's origins were darker, very much darker, and if the children celebrated it as a happy event, like Christmas, it was a symptom of how far we'd come from the time when mankind respected the forces of evil. Little Michael Myers' grandmother clucked her disapproval as the visiting rosy-faced six-year-old showed her the costume in the Woolworth box. "'What's that supposed to be?' she said, leaning forward in her recliner and adjusting her specs. "'A clown costume, Grandma.' He ran his hand over the red and green nylon jester's costume, with matching cap, with a pompon on top. A clown, she sighed. Now, mother, Michael's mother, Edith, came to the rescue. I know what you're going to say. Well, it's true, darn it. We never had that five-and-dime junk when we grew up on the farm. We took Halloween seriously. Why, when we set up scarecrows and jack o' lanterns, it was because we were genuinely trying to scare off the boogeyman. Boogeyman now, he played real pranks and did some real damage. He didn't just go around like they do today, slapping people's clothes with socks filled with chalk dust and soaping their windows. What did the boogeyman do, Grandma? Mrs. Meyer shifted uncomfortably in her chair. I don't think Michael wants to hear that, she said, looking significantly at her mother. It might give him bad dreams. But Grandma wasn't taking the warning. Nothing wrong with bad dreams. At least they remind us that things aren't hunky-dory in this world. Lord, everything is so clean and phony these days. Just one big television commercial. Clown costumes, she sighed, fingering the cheap material in the Woolworth box. What did the boogeyman do? Michael insisted. The silver-haired woman leaned forward confidently, a perverse smile lighting her pleasantly lined face. Well, if you were lucky... You got away with nothing worse than finding some of your chickens beheaded. Beheaded? The head's cut off, she explained with a relish. Michael's eyes widened. 
His mother grimaced and picked up a copy of Look, rifling nervously through it. If you weren't lucky, you lost a cow or two. Unheaded? Beheaded, yes. Were the heads just lying there next to the cows, or were they... Mother, that will be enough, really, Mrs. Myers gasped, snapping the magazine shut. But Grandma had warmed to the subject. Behind her spectacles, her blue eyes had drifted off to her girlhood, and her head nodded in memory of some awesome event. Once he burned somebody's barn down. Was it Winfield? No, Winterfield. Burnt Mr. Winterfield's barn down to the ground. Livestock and all. She looked at the wide-eyed boy, then at her horrified daughter, and realized she'd gone too far. Of course, Michael. We always suspected it wasn't the boogeyman. Perhaps neighbors getting even with each other for some slight. In costumes and masks, it was easier to get away with that sort of thing. But I do remember one incident. Not the chimney story, begged Mrs. Myers. Oh, tell me the chimney story, implored the grandson. Well, the woman said. It was Halloween, nineteen aught nine, nineteen ten. Just tell it, said Michael. Even at six, he recognized a boring attack of Grandma's. What year was it again? Yes, it was Halloween, but way after midnight, maybe two or three in the morning. We'd all gone to sleep, leaving the fire burning in the parlor because it was a terribly cold night. Oh, suddenly I hear my brother, Jimmy, shouting, Smoke! Smoke! Wake up, everybody! The house is on fire! I grabbed my robe and rushed down the stairs right behind my daddy who'd picked up the bucket of water we always kept filled at the top of the landing. Sure enough, the whole downstairs was thick with wood smoke, but I couldn't see any fire. The smoke was coming from the fireplace, and it looked as though the flue had been closed. What's a flue? Grandma explained what a flue was. We put out the embers and opened the doors and windows to let the smoke out. Then Daddy looked at the flu, and glory be, it was open. Something was jamming up the chimney. Now, we didn't have a ladder on account of Daddy having just taken it apart to replace some rotten rungs. So Jimmy had to shimmy himself up the drain pipe to find out what was obstructing the chimney. What was it? the boy asked while his mother shook her head in painful anticipation. A dead hog. Wow! Someone, or oh, something, had cut out our hog's throat and laid it atop the chimney. She laughed humorlessly. The <laughs> thing is, that hog weighed near 300 pounds. How did it get up there without a ladder? without our hearing anything, without our dog Toby raising Hob with his barking like he usually did when he heard something prowling, without disturbing a gate or making a footprint. Answer me that, Mr. Woolworth Clown Costume. I don't know. Well, I do. Tis the boogeyman. That's all there is to it. Mother, that'll do, Mrs. Meyer snapped. The boy's been having problems enough at night without you adding to them. Problems? What kind? Why, Michael, honey, run into the bedroom and try the costume on for Grandma. I'll talk it if it's too baggy. It's supposed to be baggy, said the little boy, carrying the box into the next room. Now, what's this about problems? She demanded of her daughter. Edith Myers, a younger, darker-eyed replica of her mother, 
ran a hand through her curly blonde hair. I told you, he's been getting into fights at school, at home too, with Judith. He's been wetting his bed again, which he hasn't done in three years. Fighting about what? Mother, can we just forget? The old woman's eyes narrowed. No, we can't. What kind of trouble is that boy in? Voices, Mrs. Myers finally blurted after a minute tortured pause. He hears voices. Oh, little Lord Jesus, the old woman cried. She exchanged a long, meaningful look with her daughter. I'm afraid to ask what these voices say. They tell me to say I hate people. That's how Michael put it when I asked him. Don thinks maybe we ought to send Michael to someone. You mean a psychiatrist? Yes. I don't put much stock in psychiatrists, but I don't suppose it could hurt. And I don't think it will help if that's what I'm thinking. The younger woman began to get agitated. I know what you're thinking, and that's why I didn't want you to get into this. You're going to say that's how it started with Grandpa Nordstrom. We have to face up to it, child. That is how it started with your father's father. Mother, all children hear imaginary voices. Don't you remember my bobby bear who used to... It's not the same. At least it's not something you should ignore. Does the boy have dreams? Her daughter nodded. Does he remember any? Yes, and they're very violent. Her face reddened as she turned her eyes away from her mother's piercing gaze. Mother, when Grandpa Nordstrom... That is, well, you've never spoken to us about that incident, and I think there are enough similarities. Hush! Here comes Michael. When you get home, call me as soon as you can. I think the time has come to tell you everything. Ah, there's my little boy. She cooed as Michael came back into the room with a rustle. Right out of a punch and duty show. He stood before them, an angel in red and green nylon, elastic ankle and wristbands making the costume cling at the extremities and bag out everywhere else. A ruff around the neck and the little droopy pom-pom cap completed the charming picture. Grandma's baby, she laughed clasping the boy to her bosom. Edith, please fetch me some cold cream and lipstick from the tray in my bedroom. Might as well complete the picture. I don't want makeup, Michael protested. Of course you do. You don't want anyone to guess who you are when you go around playing pranks. I'm not going to play pranks. I'm just going to ask for candy. You do that, child. You just have an innocent Woolworth kind of Halloween. She saw them out the door. Remember, Edith, call me as soon as you can. I will, Mother. Don't worry. I won't, she said, shutting the door. She began to tremble, wondering if she should have said something to her daughter about Grandpa Nordstrom's dreams. Chapter 2 Judy Myers, nude except for a pair of panties with red valentines printed on them, sat before her mirror, brushing her long, blonde hair. She sang to herself, stressing each third note as she pulled the tortoise shell brush downwards to her shoulders. She liked gazing at herself, noting how her breasts flattened when she brought the brush to her head, then rounded and filled again when the brush reached the bottom of its stroke. She was especially happy this evening because the house was empty, a rare occasion indeed. The house being empty meant no parent to bug her, no kid brother to burst in on her or try to pinch her boobs or ass or maybe peek at her through the keyhole. More importantly, it meant that she could make out with Danny on a couch or maybe even in bed without having to worry about interruptions. Fooling around in cars wasn't terribly satisfying anymore. Now that it was getting cold, you had to roll up the windows and keep the heater on, and it got stuffy and steamy. 
and now that she and Danny had gone all the way, she was eager to do it with him in a more civilized fashion. Danny's suggestion of a motel in Mapleton was not what she meant by civilized fashion. The doorbell rang. Oh, God, he's here already, she muttered, snatching up her unsexy, bulky Chanel robe and stepping into fuzzy slippers. She looked at the alarm clock on the table. It was a quarter to seven. Danny was fifteen minutes early. I'll kill him. Look at me. Yuck. The doorbell went off again, long and insistent. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. Though she knew she'd end up undressed anyway, she'd at least wanted to start clothed for Danny, and clothed in a halfway decent way, for crying out loud and not like some frumpy washerwoman. She glumped down the stairs, getting really pissed off and flung open the door. God damn it, Danny, you told me. Trick or treat. There were eight of them, holding shopping bags. A few also held UNICEF boxes, which slots in them for coins to give to their class charity. Their uniforms were all cheap and store-bought, except for one girl tricked out in her mother's peasant skirt and blouse and a gypsy shawl. There was a pirate, a cowboy, a ballerina, two Wonder Women in identical five-and-dime outfits, the gypsy girl, a spaceman, and a clown. The costumes were chintzy and looked as if they'd tear if you stuck your tongue out at them. They all wore masks, but Judy identified most of them. The spaceman and cowboy were Adam and Charlie Beckett. The pirate and ballerina were Chris and Hope Renzinger. The gypsy was Kate Schaller. One Wonder Woman looked like Christine Frank, but Judy couldn't figure out who the other one was. And of course, she guessed who the clown was, as she put the finishing touches on his outfit herself. Trick or treat, they repeated. Oh yeah, Judy teased. And what if I don't give you any treat? The children stood silently, puzzled. No one had ever denied them. They just assumed you filled the bags with goodies. If you turned them down, they wouldn't know what tricks to play. Judy stood in the doorway, enjoying their discomfort for a moment. To her right, on a little table in the hall, were six bowls filled with candy corn, Tootsie Rolls, Baby Ruth's, Good and Plenty, Popcorn, and Hershey's Kisses. There was also a dish with pennies in it for UNICEF collection. Huh? What are you what are you gonna do if I don't give you anything? They shrugged, shuffled their feet, giggled nervously. Then one of them said, We're gonna kill you. Judy sucked in her breath. Who said that? The children looked at each other, then looked back at her. Michael Myers, was that you? Because if it was, it's not funny, and I'm telling mother and father when they come home. I'm not Michael Myers. I'm a clown. Judy caught the glint of Danny's 59 Chevy turning into the street. Okay, kids, you win. Hold out your bags. She stepped to the bowls and grabbed handfuls of candy, showering it into each bag. Then she took up the dish of pennies and dropped four or five into each of the contribution boxes. Thank you, they said politely. Goodbye. Happy Halloween. They shouted over their shoulders as they toddled off to the next house. Judy closed the door and bolted up the stairs, two at a time, stripping out of her robe as she did. When she reached the top of the landing, she kicked out her fuzzies and threw the robe into her closet, grabbing a blouse and skirt, rummaging through the drawers for a bra and a pair of knee socks and a sweater. She donned these in record time, and when the doorbell rang, she was ready in a demure collegiate-looking outfit. Although both she and Danny knew where they were going to end up tonight, she decided she would at least look a little hard to get. Otherwise, Danny would think she was fast, and that would get around school. She caught her breath, then descended the stairs in stately steps. She opened the door calmly, as if she'd almost forgotten they had a date. Oh, Danny, it's you. The tall, muscular boy cocked his head. Of course it's me. Who'd you expect, Seth Dooley? Dooley was the class goof and the last person Judy would ever date. No, I thought it was some more kids trick-or-treating. Come in. He entered and shut the door behind him. I thought we'd do a little trick-or-treating of our own, he said, putting his arms around her. First you give me some of those Hershey kisses. Then I play with your Tootsie Rolls. Then we have some good and plenty. Yum. He buried his lips in the nape of her neck. Judy giggled, then squirmed out of his grasp. 
That's what you think? Look at you. You dress in jeans and a polo shirt, and you expect the girl to strip off her clothes? He laughed. What does it matter what we have on? It's what we're going to do when we have off that counts. He lunged for her again, but she ducked out of his grasp. Not so fast, Buster. First of all, it's not even dark yet. Second of all, I'm worried that more kids are going to come around and interrupt us while we're, um, discussing homework. And third of all, I don't even know if I feel like doing anything. You take a lot for granted, you know. Yeah, I'm a real animal, he said, pretending to smack himself on the wrist. Besides, my mother and father will be home any second, she said, flouncing away into the kitchen. They followed close on our heels. The hell they will be. You told me they're always going to the movies on Halloween because they hate the doorbell ringing. Hey, what are you doing with that knife? From the drawer under the sink, Judy had removed a long carving knife and now held it menacingly above her head. I'm going to cut off your what's a majiggy. That's what I'm going to do, she hissed like a witch. Hey, come on now, Danny said, backing away towards the kitchen counter. That's not funny. You could hurt somebody with that thing. That's the whole idea, my pretty, she said, sounding a little like the Wicked Witch of the West. She rushed at him, and he jumped out of the way as the blade plunged to the hilt of a fat pumpkin. Judy laughed. You goof, I'm just making a jack-o'-lantern. Danny stood plastered against the far wall of the kitchen, panting. Oh, huh, that's funny. That's terribly funny. Some sense of humor you have. <laughs> you could have killed somebody for crying out loud. Just help me cut the cap off this thing, will you? The sooner you do, the sooner we can do our homework. Danny caught his breath, then relieved her of the treacherous eight-inch blade and began carefully sawing around the top of the pumpkin until the crown came off. He set this aside, then called for a large cooking spoon and began scooping the seeds and stringy pulp out of the shell. Looks like he has more brains than you do. Shut up and finish the job, she said, curling her arms around him from behind. I'm getting hungry, and it's not for pumpkin seeds. Her hand slid down his chest and belly, and Danny's knees went weak. Then he took up the knife again and sliced into the side of the pumpkin. Baby, I'm going to set a new speed record for pumpkin cutting. Deftly, he cut two triangle eyes and a triangle nose, then a long, wide mouth with jagged teeth. Got a candle? What for? Her eyes sparkled with mischief. For the pumpkin, stupid. He gazed unbelievingly at her, then said, Oh, huh, I get it. He shook his head. I sometimes wonder if women don't have dirtier minds than men. Lucky for you, they do, she said, producing a stubby candle from the pantry. He cut a socket in the base of the pumpkin, lit the candle, and set it inside. Then he bore a few little air holes in the cap with the smaller knife to allow the flame oxygen. They cleaned up while Judy put the cutlery away, while Danny carried the jack-o'-lantern out to the front porch of the white clappered house. He, it glowed intensely in the cool autumn air, projecting its grotesque smile to the dozens of other jack-o'-lanterns that lined the placid street. Danny was not a particularly intelligent boy, but for a moment he looked out at the row of shimmering orange pumpkin faces and wondered what dark forces these totems were once intended to repel. The night was quiet and starry, with a slight breeze starting up from the north, Good football weather, Danny reflected. From somewhere down the street came the dim echo of Trick or Treat, shouted by a roving band of children. For the first time, Danny wondered about all these traditions jack o' lanterns, paper witches, and cardboard skeletons, trick or treating, apple dunking, ghosts, and goblins. But he didn't wonder long. He was getting cold and horny. Judy was just finishing sponging up the orange pumpkin juice from the kitchen counter. She dried her hands on the paper towel, then turned to find Danny. Boo! Judy's heart almost pounded out of her chest. God almighty, you scared the wits out of me, she gasped, collapsing into Danny's arms. He donned a rubber fright mask, a Frankenstein's face with sunken eyes and a livid scar across the cheek. 
He held her tightly, feeling her breasts heaving with fright through her sweater. He dug his fingers under the sweater and pulled her blouse tail out of her skirt, then clamped his hands over the warm flesh of her back. She murmured and responded eagerly with her pelvis. He found the hook and eye of her bra straps and, after a brief fumble or two, managed to unfasten them and run his hands forward until they cupped her breasts. It always amazed him that she looked so modestly endowed underneath her clothing, yet when stripped she possessed a wonderful pair of breasts. She moaned as his palms and fingers enclosed them. Her nipples went from soft to hard almost instantly, as his fingertips massaged and lightly pinched them. "'Kiss them,' she begged. "'Are you sure?' came his hollow voice. She took her head off his chest and burst into laughter. He still had his Frankenstein mask on. "'Take that thing off!' "'You take your thing off and I'll take my thing off. It's a deal.' He stripped off the mask and took her by the hand to the foot of the stairs. "'Are you sure about your parents?' They won't be back till ten at least. And Michael? I told you, he's trick-or-treating. We have time, but not all night. So no more yakking, huh? No more yakking. She turned her back on him and sauntered up the stairs, wiggling her behind enticingly and stripping out of her sweater and blouse before she'd reached the landing. Danny followed like a hungry puppy, tossing his own clothes off as he went. Stripped off all but her panties, she stood before him in the dim light of the night table lamp. Her breast rose and fell excitedly, her red nipples poking provocatively through the blonde tresses that cascaded over them. Danny stared incredulously. He'd never seen anything so beautiful. Up to now, his knowledge of his girl had been restricted to his braille reading of her body in dark, cramped automobiles, but now he feasted on her exquisite firmness, almost forgetting to take his own pants off. At last he unbuckled his belt and pulled his jeans and shorts to his ankles simultaneously. He was already erect. Oh, Judy murmured, eyes widening. He stepped up to her and embraced her, his hands enclosing her buttocks. She lowered herself on the bed, parting her thighs wide, and admitted him. Slowly, joyously, he entered her. Oh, she murmured again. She put her hands on his buttocks and pulled him into her with feline ferocity, exulting in the powerful muscles that filled her body and soul with ecstasy. So this is what it's like to do it on a bed, she whispered. This is what it's like to do it in a bed. Chapter 3 He stood in the shadow of the tall hedgerow, looking and listening. He had seen them necking in the kitchen. Then Danny had come out on the porch for a minute to set the jack-o'-lantern down. When Danny returned, they had gone upstairs. A few minutes later, the light in Judy's bedroom had gone off. Now, above the rustle of the wind and the crisp leaves of the huge oak on the front lawn, he could hear their sighs, moans, and giggles. And they filled him with murderous hate. The voice in his head had become subdued for the moment as he listened to Judy and Danny, not really understanding the significance of their utterances except that it had to do with love. He had heard similar sounds coming from his mother and father's room, but he had felt warmly towards them. They were making each other happy, his father and mother, and that made him happy too. Then why did he feel such poisonous rage against his sister and her boyfriend? It was the voice. The voice stirred up the hatred. It had done so in his dreams, and now it was doing so in real life. It had begun with the strange pictures in his head at night, pictures of people he had never seen. Oh, maybe in comic books or on television, but never in real life. People in strange costumes, animal skins, armor, leather, drinking and dancing wildly around a fire. One couple in particular, they look like Judy and Danny madly in love with each other, dancing in a circle around the huge bonfire, while he, Michael, stood in the crowd, hating them, burning up with jealousy. Then a voice had come into his head while he dreamt, a voice telling him to stop the dancing lovers, 
The voice had become louder, clearer, and more demanding lately, and it dictates more compelling. He had begun to believe that if he listened to the voice, did what it told him to do, maybe the voice would go away and leave him alone. It was no longer a dream voice. It spoke to him during the waking time, too. It had spoken loudly to him tonight, even as he went from house to house begging candy, even as he played games at the party. It had directed him to return home at once. Looking around to make certain he wasn't being observed, he slipped across the lawn past the front porch, ducking stealthily to avoid the orange glare of the jack-o'-lantern. He sidled along the shingles on the side of the house and tiptoed up the stairs of the side door. He turned the knob and opened the door. He wasn't surprised. People didn't lock their doors in Haddonfield. What was there to fear? He slipped into the kitchen and crossed to the sink. Go ahead, the voice told him. You know what to do. He opened the drawer and reached in. His fingers enclosed the thing he was looking for, and he withdrew it from the drawer. It was the butcher knife. He touched the tip with the meat of his index finger. It pricked him. He ran his thumb along the edge of the eight-inch blade. It left a neat, thin trail of blood. He glided out of the kitchen and into the parlor, where he paused, listening. He heard them talking while they dressed and straightened up. He pressed himself against the wall as footsteps creaked down the hall. First he saw Danny in jeans and blue-striped polo shirt. His hair was mussed and his cheeks were flushed as if he'd been kissed with heart passion. Then Judy, a sheet wrapped around her, which she held with her thumb against the base of her spine. The intruder gazed at her bare, dimpled buttocks and slender legs. Then he fingered the blade of his knife, trembling. They were kissing, and at last she let go of the sheath, so that all that held it was the pressure of his body against hers. Do you have to go? He held his watch up behind her head. I gotta. Your folks will be home any second. She ran her hand up his thigh. How about a quick one? Here? Now? Are you crazy? You are such a chicken. I'd be a roast chicken if your parents discovered us doing it in the hall as they walked in the door. He pushed her away, and the sheet fell to the floor. His eyes bulged as he took her body in one last time. Jeez, it's tempting. No, no, I gotta go. He picked the sheet up and wrapped it around her once again. See, chivalry is not dead. Too bad. Will you call me tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Promise? I'd have to be crazy not to, wouldn't I? They kissed one last time and parted like Romeo leaving Juliet. Judy shut the door behind him, leaned against it for a moment, and moaned in remembrance of recent ecstasies. Then she trotted back up the stairs. He stepped out of the shadows of the parlor and furiously made his way up the stairs, pausing at the landing to look and listen. Her clothes were still strewn in a trail from the top of the stairs to her bed. He followed them like a hunter, tracking the spore of his prey. He stopped outside her open door, peering inside. She sat in her red valentine bikini panties, brushing her hair before the mirror on her dresser. She hummed a little tune in her pretty voice. He stepped into the room and was halfway across when she saw him. Her eyes clouded and her eyebrows knit with puzzlement. She crossed her wrist in front of her breasts. She recognized him through his mask and called his name, bewildered. Michael, is this a joke? He continued, coming at her. Get out of here! God damn it! Get out of here before I... The first slash of the knife caught her on the wrist, splashing blood across her chest and legs. She looked at the wound with more surprise than pain. She couldn't believe it was happening. Then she realized. She jumped to her feet and backed away to the wall, knocking over her chair. What are you doing? What are you doing? She cried as he raised the blade again. 
She held her hand out to protect herself. He slashed the hand viciously, and it dropped limply to her side. Now she was shrieking insanely as she grasped what was happening. He plunged the knife into her right breast, and a great gout of scarlet blood spurted out of the wound and soaked his hand and wrist. He thrust the blade into her belly. At what point she died he didn't know, for now that she was defenseless, he stuck the knife into her again and again, jamming it into her breasts, belly, groin, arms, legs, and throat. He stabbed her fifty times if he stabbed her once. Exhalation sweeping over him like no joy he had ever known. The paroxysms began to die down and he stood over her, spent. It was almost impossible to recognize this piece of hacked flesh. Blood was everywhere and the sour odor of it rose up from his hands, intoxicating him. The gory little figure turned and stepped over the fallen furniture and scattered clothing and walked down the stairs and into the kitchen. Suddenly he realized he was hungry. He reached into a bowl on the kitchen counter and stuffed a cookie into his mouth, then opened the refrigerator door and removed a bottle of milk. He emptied half of it into his mouth with his bloody sleeve, leaving a streak of red and white across his cheek. He opened the side door and went outside, still carrying the butcher knife. He stepped out onto the lawn and stood there for a minute, indecisively. At that moment, a dark sedan pulled up to the curb. The assassin made no attempt to flee, but stood on the lawn waiting for the occupants of the car to get out. After a moment, both front doors opened and a man and woman emerged. They took two or three paces towards the house, then saw him and stopped staring at the figure in the blood-stained clown costume with the blood-clotted butcher knife in his hand. The man reached out and removed the mask from the boy's face. Michael? Well, that's it for today, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at Required Reading. I hope you enjoyed that reading. And uh, join us next time where we'll be going through chapters 4, 5, and 6 and uh, relishing in the mood of the season.